Welcome to this webinar on storage asset operations. My name is Freni Flinterman. I'm project manager at Solar Plaza and in charge of our Solar Asset Management North America conference happening on the 13th and 14th of April in San Diego this year. Um, if you would like to know more on the program and on our amazing speakers, please visit our website and you will get to see more. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know Solar Plaza yet, uh, let me quickly introduce us to you. Uh, we are a global events organizer. Uh, we are based in Rotterdam. Uh, we have a mission to positively impact the sustainable energy transition, and we have hosted numerous events around the, around the world, um, and we have a network of around 60,000 PV professionals joining us at those events. Our Solar Plaza consultancy offers solutions to your needs uh, for uh, market entry data and project development opportunities. And we have a Solar Plaza Foundation uh, that supports um, solar projects all around the world. Um, if you are interested in uh, contributing to making impact with us, please reach out to you. Uh, to us and uh, we'll make it happen together. I have a few practical notes to share with you. Uh, first of all, you will have the opportunity to submit your questions to our today's presenters. And you can do that using the questions box in your control panel on your screen. You can also use this box for any technical issues you might en encounter. Our team is here to support you with that. And today's webinar is being recorded as well, and we will share the link to the recordings in the coming few days. Well, today our moderator is Will Troppen. He is Director of Product at Power Factors. Uh, welcome, Will. Uh, you are a familiar face to uh, our audience since you are a speaker at uh, our past events, and it's always a pleasure to work with, uh, to work with you. So uh, welcome, and uh, we're happy to have you today as our moderator. Uh, so let's not wait any longer. Uh, let's get started. I'll give the floor to you, Will. Sounds have a good great. webinar. Thank you, Franny. Yes, it's, it's great to be here. And uh, thank you to Solar Plaza for hosting, and thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. Uh, like Franny said, my name is Will Tropy. I'm Director of Product at Power Factors. And I really am honored uh, to moderate today's webinar. So roughly, here's how we plan to spend the next hour or so together. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction of who we are at Power Factors, and I'll discuss some of the common challenges and opportunities that we see in the energy storage industry today. Aaron will then cover the state of the storage market and some of the operational insights that he's gleaned at Wood Mackenzie. Then Jeremy, Jeremy will come in and he'll cover some insights and case studies derived from Canadian Solar's operational storage fleet. Um, as Franny said, please submit your questions throughout the presentation. Really, don't, don't hold back. Um, we'll likely follow up with a joint article that responds to any key themes and questions that we don't get a chance to address during the Q&A following today's session. And remember, again, we are recording this and we'll make the recording and slides available later as well. So at Power Factors, it's our mission uh, to empower those who power our world with clean energy. I'm always personally really excited to talk about storage because we can't decarbonize the grid without it. We offer a software suite at Power Factors that serves clean energy assets across their life cycle. Our solutions serve technicians, control center operators, analysts, um, and asset managers from the field all the way through the cloud. And it's our goal to help companies like Solar Plaza, it's our goal to help companies scale their fleets efficiently to accelerate the clean energy transition. Uh, at Power Factors, we now serve over 200 gigawatts of clean energy assets. That includes multiple gigawatts of energy storage. I work from our San Francisco headquarters, but we operate out of 10 offices now around the world. One of my favorite things about working at Power Factors is that we're in the enviable position of working with many customers and industry stakeholders across the energy storage value chain. So we see certain commonalities that our speakers are gonna detail further, but that I wanted to introduce with you all today. I'm gonna to set the stage now with a quick summary of some of these challenges and opportunities. 
So the first thing to note is that energy storage systems are extremely complex. There are many more vendors and components and subcomponents involved than exist in the solar and wind industry. So one symptom of this is upfront, upfront design decisions are made that sometimes have failed to factor in the operational needs downstream. So we're of site, we're, we are aware of sites, for example, in which accessing components to perform routine maintenance requires partial disassembly of the pack beyond what should be expected to be necessary. And that development complexity leads to operational complexity, which translates to uncertainty, which causes risk. Risk is best allocated to stakeholders through contracts, which if done well, allocate risk to the party that's best equipped to control it. EPC warranties are, are one such type of contract. And the golden rule of best operations, battery energy storage systems operations is this, don't void your warranty. If you do find yourself in a position where you need to levy a warranty claim, the burden of proof is on the owner and on the owner's agent, the operator, to prove that operations for the entire life of the system was within the bounds of the warranty operating envelope. It's quite a burden and it means that you need to control your data. We've noticed that our customers and vendors are actually both uh, interested in standardization of contracts, of technologies, projects. Um, what we see is that no two contracts are the same. There are as many warranties as there are OEMs, for example, and data access varies widely among systems. When it comes to data, your data chain is really only as strong as its weakest link. And those with better operational data in the future will be in a position to better tune their operational models, accelerate the transition from inefficient calendar-based maintenance schedules to condition-based maintenance schemas, and to refine their bidding strategies with an informed understanding of a given operational decision on battery health. And data is power. It really is a competitive advantage. You should consider your data access needs as early in the project lifecycle as possible. One other note about supply chain, to some extent project delays are always expected, but with storage, the need for augmentation means that supply chain constraints impact storage projects beyond initial development of the asset. So now we have our first poll question before I introduce Aaron. Um, so if those in the audience are able and willing to participate in the poll, we'd really appreciate it. Um, first question is, what is your company's involvement for energy storage? We really like to get an understanding of who we have joining us today so we can make sure that we tune the questions and answers um, at the end of the presentation to who you are. So we're curious about whether you're investigating energy storage opportunities, whether you're currently developing projects, whether you're operating assets, or whether you do a mixture of, of these. And also we're interested in whether you're, you might be a vendor providing software or hardware to storage assets. Keep in mind that you can select multiple options here. Um, so we know that each of these options is not necessarily mutually exclusive. We will review the answers in just a moment. Here we go, looks like we had good participation. Thank you everybody. So a lot of people developing and operating storage plants um, with a distant, well, not a, too distant of a second. Great. So it looks like we have a good spread of responses, meaning that the, the dialogue should be should be pretty good. Um, let's go to the second poll question. Uh, poll is a bit of a misnomer for this one. It's actually a quiz, um, though there are no repercussions for getting any answers wrong. Um, the question here is what percentage of storage operational costs come from augmentation when compared to other categories, including asset management, energy management, and O&M? Is it 5%, 10%, 20%, or 40%? Great, we got, okay, so we're about evenly split between 10% and 20% with uh, distant um, distant responses at five and 40%. Great, um, I'm actually not gonna tell you the answer. Um, this, is, this is the fun of the beginning quiz, but Aaron will. Um, so Aaron is the Senior Research Analyst for Energy Storage Technology at Wood McKenzie. Um, he's going to be providing an overview of storage operational theory, really informed by real-world input. So this is not just a theoretical discussion. Um, Aaron's been working in the renewable energy industry for over 10 years. Aaron, over to you. Great. Thanks, Will. Um, like Will said, uh, my name is Aaron Marks, and I'm a senior research analyst at Wood McKenzie, focusing on energy storage technology. 
Um, beyond that, my focus narrows down further to energy storage cost and performance. So some of the big things that I focus on at Wood McKenzie are storage capex pricing, storage revenue, and storage operations. So today I'm mostly going to be speaking about storage operations, which although they have a lot of overlap with operations of many other energy assets of other power generating assets, they also have some unique facets and some specialized requirements. So when a lot of developers and asset owners are considering storage operations kind of in the entire schema of what they're doing with storage, it ends up being kind of, as Will alluded to earlier, a bit of a second order concern, especially when you consider how much CapEx is really needed to develop a storage project you know, prior to even starting to operate. And on a surface level, there are a lot of similarities between operating a storage asset and operating any other generating asset. When you're looking at something like O&M, you are looking at a lot of kind of high voltage electrical maintenance, which is going to be similar to say a substation or a lot of other generators. You're not necessarily looking at something like wind, which requires a lot of specialized skills, you know, aerial work, things that really are requiring a more specific labor force than say a utility may already have access to. That said, some of the unique challenges have to do with how storage is operated, especially when you consider things like state of charge management and the complexity of scheduling and bidding, especially if you are bidding into multiple energy product types, whether that be straight into the energy market for arbitrage or peak shifting or into the ancillary services markets. And of course, if you're doing both of those things and you may have a capacity contract on top of that, you need to be able to optimize for revenue maximization while also making sure that you comply with those sorts of agreements. So one of the big elements that you know concerns any operators, how much is this all going to cost? And we have done some assessments both by speaking directly to stakeholders in the industry and modeling through our supply chain team and our um, available supply chain data to kind of look at how we see storage operating costs changing. And although we do see a net decline, overall, it's not necessarily significant. There are kind of two opposing forces that are driving storage costs. One is the same sorts of things that are driving CapEx costs, things like the commodity cost of lithium and generally how much it costs to put together battery modules. And because augmentation is, as you see here, a very large portion of overall operating costs, those cost drivers end up having somewhat of an outsized effect. In fact, they are driving the cost declines. If you were to look at with McKenzie's energy storage pricing report, for instance, over the same time frame, 2022 to 2027, we are observing a similar cost decline in CapEx driven by changes in the E3 market and increased manufacturing capacity. In operations, what's kind of going in the opposite direction is labor. And just due to how the market is developing, there's a lot of tightness in kind of the specialized electrical labor that you need to operate and maintain a storage asset. So when we talk about, you know, the different parts of operating energy storage. One element is kind of this idea of asset management. And a lot of this really does overlap with operating any other generating asset. You know, when we're talking about commercial asset management and technical asset management, these are kind of the sort of financial, contractual, and then broad sort of maintenance activities that you would really have to do with any sort of property that is you know highly technical maybe not even energy uh you get into remote monitoring i mentioned here NERC compliance once again we're kind of talking broadly about things that are going to apply whether you're operating a battery or a solar plant or a gas turbine and then of course for financial services the same is true energy management is where you really get into the unique aspects of energy storage and it is like i mentioned before really driven by the fact that optimizing how you use your storage asset 
and how you're actually operating in terms of bidding and scheduling is just significantly more complex than it would be for, say, a solar plant where the sun is shining, you're generating power, power goes to the grid, and then other than something like curtailment, you're pretty much just good to go. In an energy storage asset, you're worried about what are you bidding into, uh, how much money you expect to make, whether or not you're using bid optimization software that is you know, reducing your potential financial risk, uh, whether you're bidding day ahead or in the real-time markets, and those also have an impact on kind of the risk you're exposed to, how you're doing state of charge management, because of course, bidding, even bidding into say, you know, the spinning reserve market, your entire day is going to be very different depending on whether or not you make that bid and then whether or not your asset actually gets called to generate versus whether or not it is just on standby during that entire hour that you have bid in. So with all of those elements, it does mean that energy management is a segment that sees a lot more investment than it necessarily would in other generating assets. And when we take a look at o &M, you know, this was a segment that I said earlier is somewhat similar, at least in terms of the work that needs to be done to something like a substation. But because of how batteries are operated, it means that the way that o &M is done tends to be different. And there's two different things going on here. One is simply making sure that your uptime coincides with when you can actually generate revenue. And this is another thing that Will was alluding to in the introduction about a shift from kind of calendar-based maintenance to condition-based maintenance. But regardless of how sophisticated your scheduled maintenance plan is, it is likely going to involve more and more proactive maintenance than another asset because the downside risk of going down at the wrong time is just simply higher. One thing that complicates this is that there really isn't one business model that the storage industry has yet decided on for who is responsible for operating these assets and providing maintenance for these assets. Um, as you see here on the slide, the overwhelming majority of storage assets we review have O&M, which is at least led by the asset owner. But this is not you know, universally true. And even if you look into say that large category of an IPP that owns and operates the asset and provides its O&M, there's also a question to how much that workforce is internal, how much they rely on subcontractors, the way in which they're actually scheduling their maintenance among a generating fleet. And then of course this trickles down further to their strategy. Is this developer going to be geographically constrained? Are they going to be attempting to buy or develop and then operate assets across the country? And how does that affect their o and strategy? And once again, there's no one winning business model. I can ask these questions across a lot of the developers we've spoken to and get many different answers. So when we ask the question of which of these models works better, the answer is we don't yet know. And that's important to consider when you're kind of looking at these strategies of how different developers are operating their assets. So I mentioned that there is more downside risk to equipment failure in battery storage. And although you know, off the top of my head say that I know the, the failure rates of different components across say wind and solar, I do know that the failure rates of equipment within battery storage systems are high enough that being proactive and having a sophisticated kind of O&M program could make a significant difference in how an operator is going to be doing revenue-wise. So as we're showing here, you're really looking at two primary components that are most likely to fail, and it's the battery packs themselves and then inverters. And those of you with experience in the solar industry know that kind of the issues with inverter failure rates and how that you know manifests they're, they're very similar because of course we're talking about similar components with pack failures there's a number of different issues and it really boils down to the fact that battery packs are built up from cells so even though each individual cell has a relatively small failure rate that failure rate compounds when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of cells across you know, multiple containers in a large storage system 
And then to make that yet more complicated, a pack failure could be as mundane as losing a container worth of cells, or it could be a fire, a thermal runaway event, which could put down your system for months. And the downside risk there is clearly even more significant. So once again, just considering all of these potentials for failure, it makes kind of that proactive and more sophisticated maintenance program that much more important. And the final thing to kind of discuss in this is augmentation. Um, when you're looking at an asset and we're assuming kind of a 20 year life, you're not really going to be able to maintain your nameplate capacity with the cells that you have for a 20 year life. And you know, operators know this. So the question becomes not if you're going to augment, but what your augmentation strategy is. So looking here, you know, we kind of assessed what it would actually cost to maintain different percentages of nameplate as your potential depth of discharge. 80 and 90% are both industry standards. And of course, depending on if you have a capacity agreement or other sort of contractual vehicle, you might be required to actually stay at nameplate, which would require more overbuilding and potentially more augmentation. So while augmenting less or augmenting further into the future, certainly costs less, there is an element of risk there. And some of it is operational risk, as I mentioned, and some of it is commodity risk. So we know what lithium prices have been doing. And as more mining capacity comes online, we are seeing that we expect prices to recover. That said, there's a certain amount of volatility and uncertainty, which is caused by commodity risk, which might make overbuilding, which is going to appear just from a, you know, levelized cost kind of net present value basis to be more expensive to be attractive if it means that you have the ability to reduce your commodity risk into the future but once again just like O&M there's no one winning strategy here so it really depends on what each developer chooses to do and how they choose to manage their own risk So with that, I will turn it back over to Will. Thanks a lot, Aaron. So I think you answered the quiz question as, as uh, part of your response here. So augmentation yes. comprises roughly 38% um, of a system's operational costs. 23 of you, 23% uh, of you, excuse me, got that answer correctly. So good job to that 23%. Great, you saw the results there again. Um, Two quick questions for you, Aaron. Um, first sure. one actually is informed by a quick audience question. So is that 38% figure uh, blended across all projects that do and do not plan to augment? Or if you plan to augment, then 38% of your operational costs will be from augmentation? So that value comes from kind of an assumption about what we see with um, augmentation in terms of developers we've spoken to. So it is assuming kind of a baseline augmentation, which is actually a blend of augmentation in the future with some overbuilding up front. So it is not necessarily the least expensive way to do it, but it is a blend of different strategies, which we see as being popular. Um, I, I'm not sure how many people we've spoken to who choose not to augment. I mean, if, if you separate out the idea of overbuilding up front versus augmentation in the future, then that's a different question. Certainly some choose solely to overbuild, some choose solely to augment. But I'm not exactly certain that I've heard from anyone who's choosing to do neither of those things and just let their nameplate degrade as it may. Great, thanks for the response. Um, and, and then on your final slide, you showed some of those different LCOE scenarios and, and you landed on the idea that the 80% depth of discharge and 15% augmentation had the lowest LCOE overall. It, does that mean that the industry has rallied around that as, as a standard? Or is there an opportunity to optimize further? And also, you know, how does that math change depending on what market you're operating in? Sure. So I wouldn't say that the industry is centered around the least costly one, because of course the least costly one also is the one that comes with the most operational risk. And there's two reasons for that. One is that you are only augmenting at kind of that 80% depth of discharge, which means you have kind of resigned yourself to losing 20% of your state of health in exchange for spending less on augmentation. 
And in some markets, that is fine. And in other markets, that's absolutely not. So just as an example, in the California market, if you are signing a resource adequacy agreement for your nameplate capacity, you're augmenting into your nameplate capacity. You have to, otherwise you're not in conformance with that agreement. And that agreement could be a large part of your revenue. The, the other part, as I mentioned, is kind of that commodity risk element. It is cheaper to augment less, but doing that amount of augmentation upfront over building, which is going to appear on your balance sheet as more money, could save that risk in the long run if you're concerned about what the lithium commodity is going to do. Great. Thanks for those quick responses, Aaron. Um, so now that we have a high-level understanding of the storage operational landscape, uh, let's talk to somebody who operates and maintains storage facilities. Um, Jeremy's our next panelist. Uh, he is the senior ONM manager for Canadian Solar, and he has over a decade of experience in power plant operations. Jeremy, over to you. Great, thank you, Will. Thanks, Aaron, for, for the slides uh, as well. Um, as Will said, my name is Jeremy McKellop. I'm the senior o and manager here at uh, Canadian Solar. I look over all of our operational um, energy storage sites here uh, in the United States. Taking a quick look at the screen before we get started, I wanted to highlight some of Canadian Solar's ONM experience on some of our flagship energy storage projects. As we can see on the screen, uh, we have multiple large scale utility applications currently in operation that total close to two and a half gigawatt hours in California state alone. Um, these systems are a combination of both standalone energy storage, um, just straight charging and discharging to the grid, and then a uh, combination of hybrid, which means coupled with the PV array um, locally at the same location uh, through the same switch yard. Uh, in the following slides, I'll go over some of those differences, uh, not only in operations, but contractual restrictions and, and caveats that we see. Um, so I'll take, you know, the theory and, and practical case studies to the day-to-day -day operation um, and what we experience uh, with boots on the ground. <clears throat> so for the photovoltaic uh, and energy storage system comparison, uh, I know we have a lot of different levels of, of uh, uh, backgrounds and, and experience uh, in this industry on the call. So this is really meant for a high level um, overview on the equipment configuration, the operation, O&M resource allocation, and, and some of the outage management that we see. So, of course, with, with the BES inverter compared to, uh, you know, a PV inverter, uh, there's going to be some differences. DC supplies from the battery banks, um, you know, strings, uh, things like that that Aaron mentioned, uh, whereas the PV side, obviously, thick panels. A um, couple differences in, in uh, equipment add-ons, uh, you know, BCI, for example, which is a battery controller interface, or uh, the battery banks use uh, an additional energy management system or BMS, as we call it. Um, there may be unique cooling systems that we use with these batteries um, that aren't necessarily uh, incorporated in, in the PV industry. Um, there's also unique safety hazards to keep in mind, right? There's, there's the, the addition of chemicals and, and gases that, that uh, we see in these systems that may not be present on, on the PV side. Um, and as we briefly mentioned and talked to already, planned augmentation, right? So uh, a little bit more on those, um, you know, the, the BCI controls and visualizes the status of the batteries and inverters. It can, you know, work as an interface for the grid controller or the SCADA system managing the inverter's efficiency and controls the charging and discharging of that energy storage system. Uh, more on the, the safety hazards uh, specifically, of course, we're still electrical. Um, you know, we are energized, low and medium um, voltage. AC is present, DC is present. So our exposure and our risk to electrical uh, safety hazards is, is still present. Um, now, one that is, is kind of new to the industry and requires more training and research is, is the fire and explosion, um, right? So. A lot of the times these systems contain combustible gases, um, fuels, ignition sources, um, obviously sufficient oxygen. And when all those are combined in, in sufficient density, it can pose a risk for explosion. Uh, chemical exposure um, in the lithium iron phosphate batteries, um, of 
along with electrolytes, lead acids, um, refrigerants, uh, coolants, and ethylene glycol. Um, they're all they're all pose a risk to to uh, both human um, and and environmental health. Uh, to combat that, you know, we see sophisticated gas and heat and light sensors to alarm um, that will notify us early on and uh, help us combat against um, any catastrophic events. Moving on to a little bit of the operational differences in, in the battery storage uh, space here. Um, you know, we operate in timed cycles of, of discharging and charging, uh, whereas we all know that the PV site will operate based on the solstice and the solar day, right? Um, we can charge or discharge really any time. Uh, depending, I will say there are some caveats depending on contractual restrictions, things like that. Um, most most of the differences we see there is where we have a standalone battery asset that is able to charge and discharge from the grid. And then we also see hybrid assets that are uh, able to charge and discharge from the grid. But we also see hybrid assets with contractual restrictions that have them charging from their coupled PV source only and does not allow uh, to charge directly from the grid. Um, all of that logic is normally built within the power plant controller and the additional EMS that the battery storage system requires. Uh, the hours of operation are heavily dependent on the grid and the seasonal needs. Uh, you know, to expound on that a little bit more is when the scheduling coordinators, um, you know, see that the market conditions are right. So as Aaron kind of alluded to earlier, uh, there are different strategies um, to use these, these assets in the markets, right? And uh, obviously being on a grid that is heavily renewable dependent, um, it's, it's also seasonal dependent. Um, so longer days, more renewables available, we'll probably see the energy storage systems not called upon to discharge until later in the day. So there's an example there. Um, generally, a best asset is going to operate um, in less hours total, uh, hours, accumulative hours over the day, um, just because the, the systems are a timed, you know, two hour or four hour uh, charge discharge cycle um, that only occurs once or twice a day. Whereas, you know, depending on the seasonal um, solstice, the PV plant may operate for, for a lot more of, of the actual accumulative 24 hours in a day period. <clears throat> uh, moving on a little bit to the o and or resource allocation here, uh, PV versus hybrid versus standalone, you know, the technician uh, resource allocation um, for those different configurations will vary. Um, you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, what level of coverage uh, does the asset owner want? What, uh, what kind of performance do you want to get out of, of the, the asset and, and what is the strategy there? Um, you know, for, for majority energy storage assets, the, the charge and the discharge happens hours and hours apart, which leads the um, inverters and battery systems there to sit idle uh, once they've reached a 0% uh, SOC or 100% SOC, which is a state of charge, the system will then go idle. Um, and it's normally idle for quite some time. Um, you know, scheduling while we while the actual uh, charge or discharge is happening is the most important. That is when you're going to see most of the failures or most of the hangups. And that is going to be when you're held uh, accountable to your availability guarantee. And it's really important during those short charge and discharge times that all of the equipment is online to to operate properly. Um, Moving on a little bit to the outage management, uh, outage and maintenance management discussion inside, uh, you know, PV outages happen every night, uh, whether we like it or not. Um, granted, I won't say we schedule an outage every night, but the assets do come offline because the sun goes down. It's pretty simple. Um, energy storage assets almost operate around the clock or they can operate around the clock, which presents a unique scheduling times for preventative maintenance. Um, right, so it's it's not as easy as saying, hey, at, at 10 p.m. tonight, uh, we know that the, uh, the PV plant's going to be offline, so let's do some substation switching and some outages. We have to be careful and cognizant of the battery and the energy storage systems that, that also may be affected by those outages because they can very well be in operation uh, that late in the evening. Uh, maintenance is normally performed on inverter and upstream equipment. Uh, 
while battery banks, strings, cells, those types of things are covered by the OEM under LTSAs and, and warranties and the, that type of language. Um, so that's something that we see on a day-to-day -day basis here. The advantage here is, is you know, CSOM or Canadian Solar Operation Maintenance Group, my group specifically, we're kind of positioned to take a lot of this in-house, um, you know, against meeting some of the OEMs, but uh, it is, it is uh, an important requirement nonetheless. All right, moving on to a little bit of a couple other topics here, long-term service agreements or LTSAs, uh, warranty management, um, and capacity augmentation. So LTSAs, this is the common agreement in place that we're seeing amongst the industry um, and that the service providers are, are being held accountable for. Um, normally we see this contract, you know, it's, it's long-term, 20, 25 years. Um, you know, we currently have LTSAs on all of our operational projects in our fleet. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to uh, change that, that methodology or, or that strategy. Um, you know, we need to negotiate and everybody really needs to look at negotiating and leveraging these concerns um, that's dictated by the LTSA before actually agreeing to them. Some of these may include, you know, your availability guarantee, your outage restrictions, your response windows, and et cetera. Um, you know, this agreement really dictates the definitions or restrictions that the project and thus its own end provider um, must abide by, right? So some of the language and verbiage around, around uh, normal operation um, or like I was saying, the outage restrictions really needs to be closely reviewed and negotiated um, because we'll see in just in the, in the next slide how that kind of adversely impacts, um, you know, the day-to-day -day operation. Warranty management. Warranty management is also another very uh, important key to becoming or to being successful at, at providing, um, you know, your operations and maintenance and services and keeping your, your asset running in, in tip-top shape, right? So equipment warranty and OEM communication, um, tracking these warranties, using some sort of computer maintenance management system to do so is very important. We have a lot of lessons learned in this. Um, you know, what we mostly see is that the OEM is responsible for a large portion of the corrective work, especially with large or catastrophic failures. You know, this helps lessen the risk that the OEM provider uh, may be faced with or take on um, at first, but however, it's still very imperative that, that we are kept in um, the loop or, or are shared um, or, or have the agreement shared with us. A lot of the warranty service agreements are redacted, things like that. So transparency is really key here and good communication is really key here. Um, looking at augmentation, I know Aaron talked a little bit about augmentation, the costs associated with augmentation, um, but as we know, you know, the elemental makeup of batteries, the actual compounds that, that they're made of, the, the commodities that they're made of, um, you know, they degrade over time. The chemical uh, reactions and, and the way that the battery actually works um, will not be sustainable over the entire planned life of the asset. Um, so projects are normally designed with a beginning of life units um, and then an end of life units uh, capacity in mind um, or overbuilt as, as we were previously discussing. Um, although a rough timeline may be given um, a capacity test still must be done and carried out uh, to determine the extent of the degradation and the extent of, of what type of augmentation and how much augmentation you're going to need um, at that specific time. Significant O&M coverage in collaboration with the develop will definitely be needed uh, to facilitate this exercise, bringing on additional equipment, um, making you know, site changes and facilitating um, that type of work that goes on long, longer into the project life cycle. I will give you a couple numbers here. Um, you know, just to date, we have not augmented any of our operational sites, but with that in mind, we do have planned uh, beginning of life and end of life units. So to give you an idea here on roughly a 600 me megawatt hour system, we may have around 272 units at the beginning of life, whereas at the end of life, we're planning on having roughly 347 battery units, which represents roughly a 27.5% increase in the battery equipment that needs to be planned and augmented for. Now to look at another site um, you know, of a different size, about half the size, uh, 300 megawatt hours, 
Um, it's got a total you know, unit at beginning of life of around 145 units. At end of life, it's planning to have roughly 177 units, which represents around a 22% increase in the battery equipment and augmentation that's gonna take place. So we can see that the, there's also a difference in percentage of augmentation just based on the difference in capacity of the, of the sizes as well. It seems that as the sites get larger, there's gonna be a larger percentage and increase of the battery equipment. Moving on to some of the O&M service provider lessons learned, challenges that we face on you know, a day-to-day -day basis, things that we have, have um, you know, fed back to asset owners, our own you know, developers, and, and keeping in mind uh, some of these things for, for future industry progression. So, um, you know, I briefly mentioned some of these terms and things that are dictated by the LTSA, one of them being um, normal operation, right? Normal uh, or conventional PV contractual language here will not suffice. Um, on the screen here, I did take um, an excerpt from a normal PV contract that we may all be uh, familiar with, um, you know, that describes on peak hours, for example, meaning that any hours ending from seven in the morning till about 10 p.m. at night, um, excluding, you know, your North American uh, electric reliability or NERC holidays, things like that. Um, but however, if you remember what I just said a minute ago, we can see these assets operating well in past two, uh, 10 p.m., um, especially in, in the summer season, where renewables are making up the demand of the grid later into the evening. Uh, now, you want to obviously uh, hold service providers accountable for when your assets are operating. So really a review of, of this language in the LTSAs needs to take place. And we all as an industry need to understand that conventional language from contracts uh, prior may not necessarily work out. Uh, we continue to see kind of uh, a hurdle or, or a challenge here when um, budgeting and, and, and bidding for uh, the cyclic behavior based on uh, resource allocation and coverage that the plants need. So both own and service providers, as well as you know developers and asset owners, they need to understand uh, the operation of their asset, uh, the strategic use of their asset, and, and when those peak hours actually um, commence and, and when we're most needed on site. Another challenge we, we have is, is outage restrictions. Um, a lot of the times we are held to the requirement of minimum interruptions, no scheduled outages during specific times or seasons. Um, and, uh, you know, typical language, again, that we, we see is, you know, unless it's uh, agreed to or coordinated in advance, you know, we can't hold these outages. And, and this is planned outages we're talking about as well. So if we are um, basically held to the restriction um, of not holding planned maintenance outages from, I'll give you a very specific example, from the seasonal timeframe of May 1st to September 30th. Now we have to make sure that the developers and the asset owners understand that that, you know, um, places uh, a challenge on meeting the period, periodic requirements from the OEM um, manufacturers on some of the equipment. Uh, more so specifically, what I'm alluding to is, is quarterly periodic maintenance. Uh, we may have uh, maintenance that needs to be done every quarter based on the OEM's recommendations. Um, however, if we are not allowed to take a planned maintenance outage for this time frame, um, we're going to miss a quarter, right? Um, May 1st to September 30th. So Q3 would be missed. Uh, so, you know, those are the types of things that we see in the field today, right now, that are, you know, weren't necessarily thought of before and uh, things that we're having to deal with in real time and, and find solutions to in real time. Um, another one here is, is the availability guarantee. Right, it's not as simple as just uh, you know measuring the AC, the AC output of, of the inverter, or it's not as simple as just measuring the, the DC input to the inverter. If you want to if you want to monitor the battery level availability, um, you know what we see right now is is a challenge with um, 
you know, the overall time frame that we're being held uh, accountable for the available availability guarantee, and then uh, also how the EMS systems are calculating the availability. Um, there's many different strategies and options to, to go with here, um, but uh, nonetheless, they all need to kind of be considered. Uh, one of the things that we found out pretty early on is that uh, once the battery system reaches a 0% or a 100% state of charge, the inverters then become idle. Well, the calculation of the inverter now sitting idle doesn't necessarily mean that it's unavailable. Um, however, we did see a lot of uh, um, HMIs or EMS systems calculating the availability as dropping off as the inverters or, or as the battery banks were, were reaching 100% state of charge and the inverters were going into idle during that charge cycle, it looked like our availability was now uh, lessening as, the, as we approached the full 100% uh, state of charge, which is not necessarily accurate. Um, these are all things that we've worked through uh, in real time with, with certain um, service providers and uh, owner groups to to uh, remediate and, and uh, make sure it makes most sense for both the, the O&M service provider and the asset owners. All right, with that, I will turn it back over to Will. Thank you. Awesome, thanks a lot, Jeremy. Um, I have a quick follow-up for you as well before we open it up to the more general Q&A. So, you just described how you as an operator inherit restrictions on your operations based on some of the contractual decisions made well before your, your stewardship of the site. That actually it reminded me of another field example that I have heard of um, in which a thermal event occurred. The result was that the battery module was flushed with fluid. That flushed module was so heavy that the forklift that was required to go in and remove the module, that size of the forklift was too big to be able to actually fit in there and, and pick up the, the, the flushed module. So I'm wondering how do your oper operational insights that you glean by operating these systems, how do they inform project development? What's that feedback look like? What's your relationship look like with those um, with those parties? Absolutely, um, good question there. Well, um, I will say this is a case by case basis um, and, and, it deter and you know it's best described um, on a project by project basis. I'll give you some very specific examples. Um, you know, we are positioned at Canadian Solar um, with our own development agency to be able to have internal discussions and feedback and lessons learned on some of the projects that we develop and turn over uh, in-house. Now, we use that same exercise uh, with other developers and asset owners that may be third party. Um, you know, we, we still gather all of that information. We still put it all into a nice, you know, report, lessons learned, um, documentation, presentation, you name it. And we share that with the EPC, with the developers, with the asset owners, and in, in a big, what we just call lessons learned um, or feedback uh, section. And we'll, we'll uh, give all that information back um, to them and, and they take it and they'll apply those lessons learned to, to future projects. So something, um, that you just mentioned about not having enough adequate spacing between uh, cubes um, or, or battery units is something that we've already uh, seen with, with trying to change out large packs, things like that. And we fed that back to our developers um, saying, hey, this is this is a problem, this, this clearance here, it's making it very hard to do these types of, of evolutions. When planning um, in the future and looking at future properties, we may want to allow for you know additional space um, to to accommodate that spacing and, and you know the development team and the real estate team and all those other uh, wonderful individuals um, they'll look at that and, and then they'll apply that to the next project so hopefully we don't face that again very good yeah thanks again jeremy excellent so uh, now we actually have time for a q a we have about 10 minutes left I have been reviewing and parsing some of your questions that uh, the audience has been submitting throughout the webinar. So thank you for those. We'll attempt to answer everything that we can uh, during this session. Um, and we'll also follow up, like I mentioned, we'll follow up with a written article that responds to any questions or themes that come up that, that we don't get a chance to fully address, or in some cases, anything that we wanna to summarize. So if I can have the presenters join me here and um, we'll jump right into some of the audience questions that we've received. Excellent. Aaron is here and Jeremy is here. So we are all good. 
Um, the, the first question that I was going to touch on here um, came early on in the presentation. It focuses on the fact that storage is a, is a new technology. And we know that impacts many things around contracts, around standardization, some of the other things I think that we're going to touch on in the Q&A. One of the things it could touch on is early failure rates. So are we seeing that there is an infant mortality issue here with some of the systems that are being deployed? And maybe, you know, is that infant mortality exacerbated because we're in the early days of deploying these systems at scale? So, I mean, observationally, yes, there's definitely some element of infant mortality that you see with these systems. Um, I'm not sure I would state just, you know, it is a nascent technology, but I'm not necessarily sure, just as an example, that, you know, inverters and storage systems fail more frequently kind of post installation than they would say in a solar installation, just as another inverter based um, technology. But, you know, it is something that we do need to take into account. And it's also something that's taken into account kind of looking at as a lot of these standards are developed. Um, my first like direct exposure to working with some of the standards that are being developed, and a lot of them are somewhat safety focused. But back in you know 2017, a lot of the major standards agencies were still working on energy storage and still working on developing a lot of these standards, which in addition to safety do also help improve kind of the uh, the manufacturing defect rate and the sort of failures that you see like immediately out of the box compared to ones you'd see as the systems age. Yeah, and I'll second that what Aaron's saying is, I mean, we, you could always apply the bathtub curve that everyone's heard of, you know, at the beginning of life, you, you see high infant mortality and failures. Um, I'll say that uh, with the energy storage system and, and the day-to-day -day operations and what I've seen, um, in the field through experience is that it's no more or less than, than normal infant mortalities that we see across other systems, like systems, PV systems, things like that in the industry. Great, thanks guys. Um, next question is, is really around augmentation. So I got a, a couple of questions here. Um, I'm familiar with some sites, I, I was talking with, um, with somebody about their augmentation plans and they actually indicated that they're not so concerned about supply chain risks, at least short term because they have some type of a locked in either price or actual equipment that they've already procured for the next several years. Um, so I'm wondering uh, around augmentation, what strategies do we see uh, being applied here? How long can you buy batteries and store them for future augmentation? So the direct audience question. Um, and then similarly, uh, do you see people actually buying equipment or are they just locking in prices? So, I mean, I can I can start by talking about what, what we're seeing contractually. Um, you know, in a lot of discussions about O&M, we're talking about long-term service agreements, but another sort of contract that comes up is the capacity maintenance agreement, where you are having that agreement with the integrator that you're looking forward to the lifespan of the battery and you are in a contract which gives you at least some mitigation of price and risk for augmenting that system. And it also mitigates other forms of risk like technology risk, which comes into some degree of procurement. Um, I'm a little less sure about you know, procuring and storing cells. And that has less to do with kind of the technical lifespan and more to do with what we're seeing just with battery demand these days. Um, although I talked about, you know, looking into commodity risk in the future, the fact is that we are currently in an inflated price environment and doing that sort of stockpiling is in some ways taking on a lot of commodity risk now because you don't necessarily know that the demand and the prices are going to be maintained. So we are somewhat stuck in a just in time supply chain just because there is so much demand for batteries and because stationary energy storage developers tend to be at the end of a path when it comes to procurement after, well, EV manufacturers primarily. You know, Jeremy, you referenced in your uh, talk, you referenced some actual numbers about your augmentation plans um, over the, the lifetime of these projects. How, how far out do you operationalize those plans? Yeah, so they're normally given in, to us and, um, you know, and developed with augmentation in mind. And that kind of to circle back on the previous question here, one of the things that that uh, is being done um, to prepare for that, we see um, 
things such as physical structures already being built. Um, we see the infrastructure, electrical structure, um, infrastructural and circuits um, already um, being planned and implemented during the, the building and, and uh, construction of these projects. So when it does come time to add that augmentation, um, a lot of the work, a lot of the infrastructure work is already there to make it a lot easier to implement. Um, now, we do have certain time frames that, that are given to us that say, okay, yeah, we think we're going to start augmenting in five years, six years, whatever that number is. However, back to what I was saying in my presentation is that you will still need to do a capacity test to determine the extent of that degradation and then also to determine uh, exactly what that augmentation is going to look like. So you have a beginning of life uh, number, you also have an end of life number, but that doesn't necessarily mean that on your first go around of, augment, of augmentation that you're just going to add all that capacity in, right? You still need to do those tests and determine. I think our industry is pretty new um, on that forefront and, you know, there's still a lot of things that we're going to need to learn, um, you know, through these next few years of capacity testing. Um, because it may be sooner than five years uh, planned for the, uh, you know, that, that project may have that number down in the back of their mind, but it, it may not necessarily come out to, to that exact um, uh, time frame. You know, Jeremy, you just touched on capacity testing. We actually received another question from the audience around, around that. So is, is there a common standard that you're adhering to for battery capacity testing? There's not a standard um, that necessarily uh, is just, you know, a thumb rule across the board. Uh, normally, we will um, base it on design drawings, design um, of the system. We'll, we'll look at the equipment manufacturer. A lot of equipment manufacturers may have a specific uh, procedure or protocol on how they want to us to carry out the capacity test. Of course, we would have to work with the ISOs, the scheduling coordinators, things like that to perform those types of testing um, and capacity testing requirements. But it, it's it's in general the same, um, you know, acceptance testing and capacity testing that you're going to do to through, you know, your mechanical subst substantial completion prior to actually taking the project commercial operation. Great. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. You know, I think we have time for really one more question, um, and then I want to make sure we wrap up on time. I'm sure many people have uh, meetings to join in, in the next couple of minutes here. Um, so staying on this theme of standardization, we got some questions from the audience around whether there's an availability standard, or is there an IEC standard that we can apply, um, like wind and, and solar industries have IEC standards around these topics. Um, do we know much? Are, are, are there real published standards that we're trying to adhere to? Um, and more generally, I would say, what's preventing standardization in the industry? I know vendors want it. I've talked to OEMs. OEMs are asking for standardization. What's actually holding us back from breaking through and standardizing this industry? Ending on oh. a small question here. <laughs> I, I think the biggest. Oh, go ahead. Let's say I think the biggest Aaron. thing is preventing uh, standardization in this industry is, you know, as we've alluded to before, just the industry's youth. If you're looking at this generation of bulk storage systems, you know, being interconnected to ISOs, we're talking about systems that were put in in PJM just 10 years ago. I mean, even though, you know, the notion of storage is much older than that, you go back to pump storage and things like that, that is that operating batteries in this way is very young. And as I mentioned earlier in my career, I was involved with some of these standard standards agencies, but one of the biggest ones, at least when I was doing that kind of in the utility space, was NFPA, doing you know safety and fire protection standards. And a lot of those standards exist and they've been promulgated. And I can't disagree with the notion of doing safety standards first. But when you're talking about a 10-year life in the industry, it just takes time and these things will happen, but they just haven't happened yet. Right. And that's exactly what I was going to say as well, Aaron, is, uh, you know, the, the infancy of the industry, um, as well as, uh, you know, the, the proprietary information in, in, the, in the actual intellectual property of, that a lot of these companies and developers want to keep close to their chest. So like you said, well, you know, o and providers are asking for it. Owners are asking for it. We're all asking for standardization. Um, you know, 
but uh, a communication and, and trying to hold that proprietary information close um, definitely slows things down. I do know that, you know, there's regulators that are always working to improve, um, you know, and improve the reliability. Uh, you know, for example, NERC is, is uh, improving on their IVR or, or inverter-based resource um, requirements. Um, so I'm sure that over, over the time that we uh, mature that we're going to see a lot more standardization. Glad to hear it. I certainly hope you're right. Um, thank you, Aaron and Jeremy, for your time today. Um, the, the web, we're right near the end here. I, I think Franny is going to jump on with a final poll question for our audience and an invitation. So thank you all. Thanks to the panelists. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Will, for your excellent guidance during the past hour. Um, and thank you, indeed, Jeremy and um, Aaron for sharing your insights. I'm not going to do another poll with you. Uh, looking at the time, I think it's best to conclude this webinar. Uh, I would like to say uh, we are uh, hosting two uh, great sessions on storage at our event in San Diego in April. So we look forward to continue the conversation on uh, storage asset operations with you over there. Uh, so that's why we want to meet you in person and we are sharing this 10% discount. Um, if you register for the event, you can use this promotional discount code in the registration process. So looking forward to seeing you all in San Diego. Have a great day and uh, see you later. Bye bye.